up in Harlem at a table for two. There was four of us, me, your big Pete, and you. So welcome to our first Glad Trad Q&A, and uh, I have with me today Dr. Taylor Marshall. Dr. Taylor Marshall, thank you so much for joining me. Father Nick, it's great to be here. Well, today is the Feast of St. Joseph, so first of all, congratulations to you, biological fathers, and all those who uh, stood up for our church as St. Joseph is the uh, guardian of the church. I know a lot of the People listening see you as a hero of, um, of one of the great people who defends our church on probably six continents at this point. So congratulations and thanks for joining us again. Thank you. He is the terror of demons. We need to remind ourselves and the demons constantly that St. Joseph is the terror of demons. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to actually air this on the Annunciation. So even though you and I are recording this on St. Joseph, um, the Annunciation is my favorite feast. I think it's the most underrated of all feasts, and if I were Pope, I would make it a full octave, since it's actually the incarnation. Um, and so today we're actually going to talk a lot about Christology and Mariology. Christology is study of Christ. Mariology is the study of Mary. Um, but first, what I'd like to do, and I think I'm going to make this kind of part of the glad trad experience. Um, it's a pretty informal thing we're doing. I'm usually going to ask people just the basics of their conversion story. And and uh, Taylor, if I sound like Chris Farley on his Chris Farley show, like if I... Uh, sound in awe of you at any point, don't let it go to your head, okay? Okay, that's good. <laughs> so maybe give us a 60-second, um, uh, maybe two, no, we'll say two to three-minute um, conversion story, if you wouldn't mind. So I, I, was, I was born into a, a good, you know, nominal Protestant family in Fort Worth, Texas, and was raised right and wrong and virtue, and it was moral, but we weren't Christian. Uh, we didn't pray ever. We never attended church. We celebrated Christmas and Easter, but we did not attend church. Um, so I had a very faint understanding of who God was, no real understanding of who Christ was. Um, my best friend growing up, he was Missouri Synod Lutheran. He said I was going to go to hell because I wasn't baptized. I said, well, what's baptized? Mm. And um, I was kind of probably around seven or eight when I learned that. I kind of just resolved, well, I'm going to hell because I'm not baptized. And then when I was a bit older, um, my dad got me the autographs of all the Texas Rangers, the Major League Baseball team. <laughs> and uh, the catcher, Daryl Porter, wrote under his name R-O-M-10-9, and somehow I knew that was a Bible verse. We had a Bible in the house of the King James. I found it. Mm -hmm. I looked it up, and Romans 10-9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I thought, ah, I can be saved without this Lutheran baptism idea. This is uh, non sacramental salvation here in Paul. And so I believed the first time. I think the Holy Spirit actually did work in me initially. And yeah. um and I even said out loud with my mouth, Jesus uh is Lord, and he was raised from the dead just to cover my bases, because that's what the Bible said. And that was the beginning of a journey for me when I was, you know, just a, a young man. And uh as I got older I really got into the Bible and I read the Bible twice, uh Genesis to Revelation. Uh, in one year when I was a teenager, just because I wanted to know who God was, and I had no right teachers, no preachers, no catechisms. Looking back, I'm very grateful on that, because the foundation yeah. was, was the sacred scriptures. So, uh, Also, when I was a teenager, I, I felt that God was calling me to be a pastor, to be a preacher. And so I began to study, and that led me to the question, and that is, in which church will I be a pastor? because my initial coming to the faith was not through any ecclesial body or denomination or tradition. Right. And if I can uh, jump in real quick, you know, yeah. I'm rereading, or actually, no, I'm reading for the first time the Catechism of Pope St. Pius X, and he talks about the difference between sanctifying grace and actual grace. And I think it's important since, you know, most of my listeners, probably maybe half, maybe 75% go to Latin Mass. And it's important to notice that God works actual graces. St. Thomas Aquinas would say this, too, even in someone who has not been baptized, that we get these actual right. graces. So, so your um, uh, inspiration to give your life to Christ via Romans 10.9, um, even according to super old school Thomistic theology, was an actual grace from God. Yeah, I mean, this is what uh, St. Augustine and later St. Thomas Aquinas would call prevenient grace, which is an actual mm -hmm. grace. It's not sanctifying grace. Exactly. And what it's it's... It's the Holy Spirit tearing up and tilling the ground uh, and, and putting a seed there, and then the seed gets watered in baptism. Literally watered. Beautiful. Yeah. 
so that was that was sort of how I began, and then I, you know, I the next phase was okay. Well, what is the true church, or what's the right church, or the best church for me to be a pastor slash preacher? And that went on for a long time. I went to some Bible churches. I went to some Charismatic Assembly of God. I went to some Lutheran. Um, in college, I went to some kind of Bible mega churches. Um, towards the end of college, was kind of became a Calvinist and um, reformed, and went to a PCA church for a while. But it was during this time that I was studying church history. Ironically, reading Luther and Calvin, they were talking about Augustine and. Calvin even talks about Bernard of Clairvaux. Is that right? Who are these? Yeah, the, who are these guys? So I started looking them up and going to the library. This is all pre-internet days, folks. <laughs> no Google searches, no Wikipedia. <laughs> if I want to know who Bernard of Clairvaux is, I had to go to the college library and look it up. And The, and the started, Dewey Decimal System. Exactly. Well, we had computers at that point to look okay. up. Okay. <laughs> Dewey Decimal for me is elementary, but I could have done it in Dewey Decimal. But yeah, people, our millennials have no idea what we're talking about. They're like, why did you just pull your phone out? And look That's it up. right. And so I started, you know, reading these things, and I, I began to realize that the early church, they had bishops and sacraments and Eucharist, and they baptized infants, which I was already basically okay with. Um and all these things, I said, wow, it's pretty Catholic. You know, it's definitely not a megachurch. It's not yeah. praise and worship. This is liturgical. And so at this point, I was still pretty anti-Catholic, just from hanging out with evangelicals a lot. And I really felt at home with Anglicanism. Still in Texas at this point? Correct. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, for example, my diocese, Episcopal diocese in Fort Worth at that time, they, you know, they still don't uh, ordain women, ordain homo- active homosexuals. It was pretty conservative and pretty high church or Anglo-Catholic. Right. And so I eventually um, was ordained in that tradition as an Episcopalian priest. And at that time was, you know, praying the rosary. And, you know, people always ask when you consecrated or fake consecrated because Episcopal priests aren't real priests. Yeah. Did you genuflect? Yes, I did. You know, we believed that it was the body and blood. And we received, you know, at a altar rail, not standing up. And, um, and we oh, had that chant. We chanted. Than... We chanted. Yeah, and wow. um, it was it was very high uh, high church. So when I became a Catholic and saw people standing to receive communion, I was sort of bewildered by. Well, I thought these people believed in transubstantiation. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Novus Ordo liturgy, I mean, Anglicans didn't have a Vatican too. So it was That's still. Right. I mean, for example, every time Father that I celebrated the Holy Communion rite in the Episcopal Church, every time it was ad orientum. How embarrassing. Yeah. Yep. At a high altar, marble altar. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I came to faith. And then I, I, as I was after I was ordained, I was doing pro life work and really dealing with doctrine and dogma and having controversy in the parish. Mm. Um, over, I also kind of believed that contraception was a sin. I mentioned that in a homily once at an Episcopalian church. Good thing there's no more controversy in your life anymore, right? Right. Exactly. (laughs) And. Basically, my wife, my wife was watching a lot of EWTN, mm-hmm. and we went to Rome, and I met uh, Monsignor Conley, who's now Bishop Conley yes. in Nebraska, and he really challenged me. He was not being ecumenical and, you know, letting me awesome. just be an Anglican, but he really challenged me. And I came home from that trip in Rome and uh, saw entry into the Catholic Church and entered in in 2006 with my wife. Uh, our three kids, well, Joy was pregnant with our fourth. But yes. Our three kids, we uh, were received into the Catholic Church in Fort Worth, Texas, by Bishop Van, who is now the Bishop Ordinary of Orange County. Congratulations. So 13 years later, uh, still welcome to the Catholic Church. Yes. It's just even now, 13 years you're later. meeting tons of people, but still thir- welcome. 13 years later, sadly, I say, the Catholic Church has started to feel more like the Episcopal Church. Um, the hierarchy, and I mean, you, you made that correction on yourself that the uh, I watched you and Tim last week, and you said what the Catholic Church is doing, and then you backed up and said what the Vatican is doing, and exactly, you know, and that's where, and you know, your church history so well is is even in the Arian crisis, there's the divine element of the church and the human element, and the divine element remains the church triumphant and spotless in heaven, but. Boy, it's truly a time of crucifixion at the human element of the church right now, isn't it? It is. It is. But I, you know, I don't regret becoming a Catholic. I still believe it. I believe it more now than I did when I came into the church. 
And uh, I'm just, I'm ready to humbly, reverently, and respectfully fight for these dogmas, uh, for the liturgy, for the truth. I want my children and my grandchildren to experience the glories of Catholicism, hopefully a new era of the glory of Catholicism. So I'm ready to win it. Yeah. I sometimes think it's like Star Wars that it's, you know, the rebels against the rebels are actually the obedient. And, you know, <laughs> and yeah. so people like you and me are called rebels, but it's like maybe in the sense that the Jedi are seen as rebels. But when there's a time when the Empire gets evil, I mean, this is dangerous talk because that's probably what Luther thought of himself, too. But the right. difference is we're sticking behind every pope, every doctor of the church, all the church fathers and the apostles. I mean, you know, Vatican I says God is neither a deceiver nor can he be deceived. So this is where we can put our trust in divine revelation. If we were only trusting scripture, I'd be like, oh, we're, we're in dangerous ground. But um, when we're looking at what all the church fathers have taught and all the popes and everything, then, then I think, as you said, we can humbly fight for what the church has always taught. Yes. You know, I actually, um, I first heard of you in about 2014. I was a uh, parish priest. I was a parochial vicar at, um, off Colorado State University. And I was in a Fuzzy's taco shop. This was 2014. And I had a student named Kevin who was joining a uh, traditional Latin mass order in France called the um, Order of Vincent Fair. They're, they're sort of like the fraternity St. Peter for the Dominicans. So they're in union with the sure. church and everything in France. And he, so he was going to spend some time in Rome. And he handed me your book in line at Fuzzy's Taco, uh, Eternal City. And I started uh. flipping through it. And I saw you know Bishop Conley because he was our auxiliary bishop um, here in Denver. And I thought, wow, I've never seen someone in this tradition who understands both dogma and liturgy and church history and apologetics. Um, and so I bought your book, and just like every book, I always start it and never finish it on my way to Rome. <laughs> but, I had, but I had it on my Kindle. Maybe, would you mind just saying, just briefly, since we're putting this up on the, um, on the Annunciation, I, I didn't see this in the beginning when I was reading that in Fuzzy's Tacos. What did Mary play what role did Mary play in your conversion, your family's conversion? Was, this, was she a stumbling block for joy? Was she a springboard? It's usually one of the two I noticed, and usually women are more fierce about it than men at first. You're precisely correct, um, about, especially about women and Our Lady. Yeah. Everyone that I know, especially uh, clergy, Protestant clergy who are coming into the Catholic Church, but the wives are either all in on Mary or can't stand her. <laughs> You're right. Uh, and I think it's because she's a woman, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so she's either competition or she's the greatest thing ever, and exactly. um, they always come, they always come around. But you know, there's a phrase in Latin that is, um, "ama aut odiat nihil tertiar mulier." Either a woman loves or hates. There is no third. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was the question? Oh, our lady. Oh, Mary uh, and Joy. Know, for, and you, for us, yeah. yeah, for us, for Joy and myself, we were always. Well, there was a time when I was a teenager and I first kind of got into evangelicalism. I, you know, I heard about worshiping Mary. And, oh, that's bad. Sure. But, and then also in Texas, you know, I remember seeing like, um, Our Lady Guadalupe airbrushed on a low rider, you know, on a hood. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So even, gang- that, even, it, even like MS-13 oh, yeah. has it going, you know? Oh yeah. I, I once talked to this gangster Mexican guy. He had a tattoo of Our Lady Guadalupe and I said something about Our Lady and he goes, no, dude, this is not Mary. This is Our Lady Guadalupe. I said, no, it's the Virgin Mary. He's like, dude, <laughs> he's like, dude you're white. You don't know. And I was like, uh. <laughs> That's right. And I, I always have to, and I love Mexico. I've spent, I yeah. probably get along better with Mexicans and whites. So this isn't anything against the Mexican guys. But they always tell me how she's the patron of Mexicans. And I always say, no, no, es la emperatriz de las Américas. She's yeah. empress of the Americas, America, all the Western plural. Hemisphere. Yeah. She's not just Mexican, all right. the Western Hemisphere. Right. Well, I know someone used to say, well, Our Lady Guadalupe didn't appear in Mexico. She appeared in Spain. Yeah. Technically, that was Spain. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Anyway, uh, so that was kind of my impression, you know, like maybe superstition, you know, like you see Our Lady Guadalupe in every single Mexican restaurant you go to in Texas. Right. right. But I didn't know what it meant. Um, but once I kind of learned later in college, you know, I, I loved the rosary. I was praying the rosary long before I became a Catholic. My wife actually prayed to Mary as a little girl. Wow. Just intuitively, my wife Joy was born on August fifteenth. Awesome! I'm August sixteenth, but she's the oh, assumption. Wow. Yeah, how beautiful the assumption. So she was born on a Marian feast day, and so we always celebrate her birthday with our. I think we're birthday. all about the same age. I was born seventy eight. Me too. Yeah, so nice. I'm forty. Awesome. Um, so um, 
So yeah, I was always very open to Our Lady, and uh, I've always been a Marian maximalist in my theology. Awesome. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Well, we'll get along great today. Well, I think that's a good um, springboard just to the dogma, because I put up on uh, Facebook any questions. That's kind of be the uh, kind of the modus operandi of this glad chat Q&A is to ask people if they have any questions. And so I'm going to let Dr. Taylor Marshall do most of the talking, but I just want to give a little launching point of Ephesus um, since we're putting this up on the Annunciation. You know, Ephesus was a council in the church in 431 when Mary was ruled to be the mother of God. And a lot of people don't understand when they look back why Mary was ruled to be the mother of God. It was supposed to be a Christological council. And it's been said that every clarification on Mariology is actually a clarification on Christology. Now, you might remember Father um, Father Grishel. He was the founder of the CFRs out in the Bronx, and he tells an amazing story. When he was in a big Baptist church, when he was giving a talk, it wasn't you know, a worship service, but he was giving a talk, and he said to thousands of black people, was Mary the mother of God? And he said, you know, the first thousand people in the front rows all shook their head no, but the big guys in the suits and the ties, the ones who surrounded the chief pastor in the far back, they were all nodding their heads because they had gone to seminary. And they understood that because Christ was one single person, a divine person with two wills, a human and a divine will, as well as two natures, a human and a divine nature, Mary couldn't be the mother of a nature. Mary can only be the mother of a person. And when Father Grishel said that on EWTN, it really clicked with me that you can't be the mother of a nature. And because even though Mary was not preexistent, I'm sure all of our listeners know that Mary was not preexistent. Christ was only a divine person. Now, he was 100% human and 100% divine, but the center of his responsibility uh, was divine. And so in Ephesus at the time, there was just riots. People were so happy. There was partying in the streets in Turkey all night when Mary was ruled to be mother of God because this meant um, Christ was in the center of his responsibility, a divine person. So I think my first question for you on Ephesus, um, Dr. Taylor Marshall, is, why do you think the early heresies were all God-centered and the modern heresies are man-centered? Uh, I suppose I would disagree with the question. I, I think yeah. that the, the modern heresies, and especially modernism, is, is an attack on God. So it's, it's man-centered, mm-hmm. but it's still it's the synthesis of all heresies, and so it's you know, it's denying what was said at Ephesus. It's denying what was said at Constantinople, Nicaea 1 and 2, all these things. And in that way, it's sort of the ultimate purge of trying to get everything divine out of Christ and out of our lives. And so religion becomes a sentiment. Religion becomes an experience. But religion is not something that's perennial. It's not something that's um, ideal and unchanging or divine. And so we see that all the time around us. Uh, modernism, people don't call it modernism, but capital M modernism is just interpreting Catholicism in light of current human experience. It's an awesome point. You know, I think you're right because I've often thought we need to have a synonym for modernism because I think sometimes people can hear us rip on it and we've heard so much from that single word that hasn't actually hashed it out. We almost should call it like anti-supernaturalism or anthropocentrism, you know, something like that. But I think we've got immune to hearing it's a synthesis of all heresies. But you make a great point that really everything we're hearing really is the synthesis of all these heresies. I mean, a certain person who will remain unnamed said at Epiphany, I think it was 2015, that certainly Jesus would have begged forgiveness of Mary and Joseph in the temple. Now, we won't go down that rapid hole, but I mean, that right there is Arianism. It's overturning Ephesus. It's, you're, ex- you're exactly right. This is truly over turning all of these early councils that um, Christ has been defined as divine. Yes. Yeah. That's it's point. unfortunate. Modernism is probably the worst. I'll agree with you. It's the worst named heresy of all time. You know, I got yeah. Arianism, <laughs> Nestorianism, Iconoclasm, mm-hmm. Iconoclast, and then modernism. It just, it, it's not biting. I, no, I it makes you feel bad if you have an iPhone or something. Right. Yeah. I wish Pius X had, had named it something differently, but that's the name we have, and that's the name I go with. And I honestly think that it's up to theologians and priests and yeah. preachers in 2019, right now, we need desperately to resurrect 
people's awareness of the heresy of modernism. It has been defined repeatedly by popes in the yes, papal documents, in church documents. And it's just kind of like since 1965, no one ever said it again. But That's we right. need to bring back the awareness. I would encourage everybody during Lent, before Lent's over, read Pascendi by Pius X. That's, That's a, right. it's, it's a little long. It's a 30 pages or so, but it is Pius X defining really seven bullet points of what modernism is. He, he defines modernism as, you know, with regard to science, with regard to history, with regard to personal belief, with regard to philosophy, with regard to theology. It's very well laid out. He does a super job. And awesome. people, yeah, people need to read Pascendi by, by Pius X. I've said on some other podcasts and some other um, things that I've written that really the center of modernism, and I agree with you, I mean, I've basically given my Lent to Pope, Pi, Pope St. Pius X, so I don't think he'd mind me saying this, but I actually agree. I wish he had named it something besides modernism. Um, what would you have called it? Dr. Marshall? I think what comes to mind is naturalism. Yeah. I think I'd call it naturalism because modernism is the Catholic version of, and, you know, don't turn off the, the show, guys, Freemasonry. This is not a conspiracy theory. Many popes wrote against Freemasonry, but Freemasonry is the occult uh, secret society attempt to produce alchemy, right? Alchemy is turning, like, lead into gold. It's this medieval fascination. If we could just, you know, remember gold is money. So if we could just take rocks and make it into money, how awesome that would be. But alchemy is really satanic because it's what, what Lucifer did. He said, without God's grace to elevate me, I want to use my own normal nature and extend it so that my nature becomes God. That's like turning lead into gold, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the Freemasons did spiritual alchemy. They said, let's, Deny grace, let's deny the supernatural. All religions are equal. All religions are parables or drawings or sketches of God. And all we need is our own intact human nature, and we'll use our own human nature to transcend and create a utopia on earth, a natural utopia by our own human nature. That's right. That's Freemasonry. That's, that's what they wanted to do. Um, you can see the benefits. You know, if you don't believe in God, of course that's what you want to do. Um, but when that came into the Catholic Church, you can't just say that openly. What you have to do is you have to start redefining Catholicism to say what naturalist Freemasonry sought to achieve. And, so and I like Pius you calling the, it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So Pius X identified it, and he called it modernism because in the church, they were taking the modern philosophy, the modern age, and adapting Catholicism to the modern way of thinking. So that's why he called it modernism. But I think in our time that can be a little bit confusing because, like you said, people think of the modern age like, you know, TVs and telephones and laptops. And I like the idea of calling it naturalism because if you look at the, the first or the only or at least the big fish that he excommunicated, Father Wazi, uh, yes. Alfred Wazi, you know, it had – it had nothing to do with what we now debate as modernism, contraception, the Latin mass. It was everything to do with divine revelation and sacred scripture because he was already doubting the miracles of the Old Testament, doubting the miracles of the New Testament, and basically gave a human-centered, naturalistic interpretation of, every, of everything. And Pius X was prophetic because he saw, whoa, this is dangerous because it's so attractive. And I personally believe it became even more attractive after two world wars and the gulags because we didn't even remember what humanity is. So... When you fill seminaries with current people who are like Father Luazi, they don't get kicked out because they do sound compassionate. And after two world wars and, you know, communism killing over 100 million people, we're kind of desperate to, to actually hear why it's good to be a human being. Um, but Father Luazi would have a, a, a no problem in 95% of the uh, current seminaries coast to coast today. No, exactly. And, and, you know, we heard a certain person who will be remain unnamed to you who said, you know, the, the multiplication of the loaves wasn't a metaphysical transformation of pieces of bread. It was really the miracle of sharing. That's right. It was the miracle in our hearts of generosity. That's modernism, folks. When you take the supernatural and you make it natural, that's modernism. That's naturalism. One of the uh, seminary, one of the professors at our seminary, I think you probably admire him, and I'm sure you know who he is, but he'll remain unnamed um, for good reasons, not the bad reasons of who we just got over. But he was, uh, he heard that garbage in the 70s, 
from a priest, you know, that the miracle was that Jesus got everybody to share their lunches. You know, there was no miraculous multiplication. And so he came up to the priest shaking hands afterwards, and he goes, Father, I was really offended at your homily. And the priest said, oh, oh no, you were offended. I mean, that's just the worst thing for a modern <laughs> priest, right? He's like, oh, no. Well, yeah. He goes, well, I thought it was racist. Well, the guy's blood pressure doubled. It was racist. What? He said, yeah, I found it anti-Semitic. Well, then his blood pressure tripled. He said, how did you find it anti-Semitic? He said, because you just told everyone it would take a miracle to get the Jews to share. Oh. And the guy, <laughs> the guy was absolutely horrified, you know. Right. Um, That's what he's saying, so though. I like, I like flipping those things on the liberals like that to make them rethink what they're actually teaching. <laughs> right. But, exactly. Um, so I want to jump from Ephesus to just some of these topics that we were given. The, the painless birth of Jesus, that was an interesting topic that someone put up. Um, and it's amazing how many people who are who believe in the true presence of the Eucharist, who are even anti-contraception, believe that if we say that Mary had a painless birth, we actually deny her humanity and Christ's humanity, and we're better off saying it's painless. Um, you and I both obviously believe it was a painless birth because it's unanimous among the Church Fathers. It's in, um, I think, Media After Day by Pius the Twelfth. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but why do you think that's important theologically that we understand this is part of divine revelation, not just a devotion? Yes, uh, this is a big issue. I've spoken so often, and it's one of the things that I, I get criticized for so often is teaching that Mary's um, delivery of our Lord was not only painless, but that her physicality remained intact. That's the teaching of the apostles and the church fathers. For example, um, St. Augustine of Hippo says, it is not right that he who came to heal corruption should by his advent violate integrity. Mm. And mm. Pope Leo uh, the Great said, she brought him forth without the loss of virginity, even as she conceived him without its loss. Now, obviously, Leo the Great here, when he says without the loss of virginity, he's not talking about sexual intercourse. He's talking about her physicality, her anatomy. Right. Right. That she was, and, she was truly a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. Exactly. Exactly. That her, her, her physicality was, was not uh, broken. And people just get so worked up when you mention this. But it's, you know, Thomas Aquinas, you know, right. he says in the Summa Theology, it's in part three, question 35. He says, consequently, there was no pain in that birth. And mm -hmm. neither was there any corruption. On the contrary, there was much joy therein, for the God-man was born into the world according to Isaiah. Like the lily, it shall bud forth and blossom and shall rejoice and, uh, rejo with joy and praise. And I mean, you go, you know, Bonaventure, even right. Dun Scotus, I mean, anybody you want, it was never contested really until, I mean, it was contested by some, but it was firmly and continually taught from the 300s all the way up until really the 1940s and 50s is when mm -hmm. you start seeing um, Nouvelle Théologie um, types, resource mont types denying it. But we have to believe it because if you read the catechism of the Cal Council of Trent magisterial document, came out in 1566. It's infallible. Yep. It says, to Eve it was said, in pain you shall bring forth. Mary was exempt from this law. For preserving her virginity, for her virginal integrity and violet, she brought forth Jesus, the Son of God, without experiencing, as we have already said, any sense of pain, end quote. Beautiful. And I think the reason the Nouvelle Theologie barks up that tree is with a good intention. As you know, a, a moral act has to have a good, in, a good intention, a good right. end, and good circumstances. <laughs> the object is obviously bad. But just to defend their intention, it's they want to make Jesus and Mary accessible. But once again, this is this heresy of naturalism, of denying what is so supernatural about the Holy Family. And I think the import of really defending the Church's teaching actually doesn't only lead to God's glory and the preservation of Mary's holiness, but also actually leads to the salvation of souls and understanding. Quick example from that. I was working for Focus when uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ went out, and I had a friend mm -hmm. named Jim, and I think he's got five or six kids now, but it was his first kid being born. And he believes that Mary's, um, Mary giving birth to Jesus was painless, as, as you and I believe. 
And right when that movie came out, he had had um, his first son born and he was there for the birth. And, you know, he had only seen movies of baby's birth. Now I, I'm an ex paramedic, so I've helped deliver babies, but he had never seen anything but a, you know, a movie. And you know, the movie is the baby always comes out perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it's a really bloody slimy mess when a baby's born, of course. It is. And what he noticed when Mary, and now we're switching to the movie, Mel Gibson's Passion of Christ. I mean, Christ had been spit on. Imagine just the, the, the lubrication of the saliva and, mm. and just all the blood and everything. He immediately understood looking at Mary holding Christ in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and then his own son, that Mary gave birth miraculously without pain because she was going to hold him so bloody and slimy at the cross, which was going to be your and my birth into eternal life. So she, um, at the cross, is the mother of the church and holds us um, right there. I mean, not that we're, we're Christ, but there's something mystical that she was able to go through that painless birth, but then held Jesus in her arms when he, when he was dead, full of blood and slime. That's, yeah, that's correct. You know, there's um, a lot of people in apologetics, will, they'll say, well, in Revelation chapter 12, there's a woman clothed with the sun, and you say that that's Mary who gave birth to Jesus. But it also says that, that she cried out in travail yes. when she gave birth to him. So they say, aha, see, the Bible teaches Mary had a painful birth. That's right. But the Catholic response to that in apologetics is, is that Our Lady, her birth of Christ was actually threefold. It was in Bethlehem on Christmas morning. Mm-hmm. It was again at the cross mm-hmm. when Christ's side was opened and blood and water came out. He birthed the church, St. Augustine said there. Mm-hmm. And then again at Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came down on Mary and the apostles and the church was formally born. And it's in that second one where Our, Our Lady continues her, her spiritual generation of Christ in her ascent to the death of Christ when a sword pierces her own heart. And she does cry out in pain and in travail at the cross. Yes. So Beautiful. when people say, people say, oh, well, Mary, she's not, you're saying she's not human if she didn't experience pain like my wife did in childbirth. And they say, well, no, be, I mean, your wife didn't experience anything close to what Our Lady experienced at the foot of the cross, knowing her son That's was right. God and innocent and was paying for the sins of the world. So she underwent the greatest pain that any woman could experience. Childbirth is just nothing compared That's to right. that experience at the foot of the cross. And, and people ask, well, how could, if, if Mary didn't have pain and her, phys- her physicality remained intact, during the birth, how did our Lord Jesus Christ get out of her uterus? This is, this is what people will ask you next. Mm-hmm. And the answer is also provided by the Catechism of the Council of Trent. This, this goes back to St. John Chrysostom, and he made an analogy of how light can, yes. um, can, can go through a pane of glass. But the, the light itself is not, if it's clear glass, there's no tint in it or no blemishes in it, the light moves through the glass so much so if it's clean, you could run right into it if it's a sliding door, right? That's right. And yeah. so the, the Catechism of the Council of Trent um, says, and he afterwards went forth from the sepulcher while it was closed and sealed and entered the room in which the disciples were assembled, although the doors were closed, or not to depart from the natural events, which, were, which we witness every day, as the rays of the sun penetrate the substance of glass without breaking or injuring it in the least. So, but in a more incomprehensible manner, did Jesus Christ come forth from his mother's womb without injury to her maternal virginity, end quote. That's the Catechism of the Council of Trent. So this is what we have to believe, people. Dr. Marshall, uh, why do you think that most seminary professors in the United States believe the resurrection at this point? Now, maybe the 70s and 80s was different, but I I would posit the theory that 95% 95% of the seminary professors in this country, coast to coast, believe that Christ truly physically rose, but will not admit to that miraculous birth of our Lady. At least I'll hold a 95% for the, the good side, and I would imagine it's, it's probably most seminary professors um, would not hold that, that same light passing through um, as Christ walked through the door. 
held true for the painless birth of Jesus. Why do you think they hold the one miracle and not the others? Because we're a Protestant land that accepts one, or what's the deal? Uh, I, there's two reasons. Uh, the first is feminism, um, and it's assumed that you know celibate males can't say anything about the feminine, mm. or it's sexist and it's mm. patriarchal and it must be rejected, and that these are just celibate old men who think that you know women's anatomy is icky and gross, and how how could Jesus go through the icky and gross? Oh, uh, and so they want to they want to gotcha. defend themselves from that. But I would also, I think you're a bit more generous um, regarding seminary professor, because I've been to a lot of seminaries, and I've taught in a <laughs> seminary, and I've been around a lot of seminarians, and I'm in touch with dozens of them. Yeah. And uh, I suspect that a great majority, no, I'm not going to say a great majority, many, maybe it's not 51%, do not believe in the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Really? Even so? Carl, Even oh. Carl Rahner said that the resurrection of Christ was not a historical event. That's wow. a quote. Wow. Uh, Sh- Edward Schilbex, who is a popular oh, theologian favorite, during ascetic yeah. and Vatican, he's the one who said that tra- we shouldn't say transubstantiation, we should say transsignification, mm-hmm. because the bread no longer signals or signs bread, it signals Christ, it's a heresy. That's even worse than the, uh, what, did Lu- what did Lutherans call it? Lutherans do consubstantial. Yeah, yeah. consubstantiation, right. Yeah, so Schilbeck had that false idea, but Schilbeck also said the resurrection of Christ has nothing to do with his corpse. Mm. And this is this modernist idea, we're going back to modernism, right. that says the resurrection of Jesus, just like the multiplication of loaves is really sharing people's lunches, the yeah. resurrection of Jesus is that Jesus truly in his person lives on in our hearts. He rose again in our hearts. That's what they teach. And this isn't any exoneration for any of them, but I really think people did this stuff to try to make this more attractive to doctors and lawyers and people out there. Even Pope John Paul II signing off on the JEDP theory, if for the listeners yeah. who don't know, um, there was a theory, I think 19th century Germans came up with it, Protestants, that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, was written by four different authors, the, the Yahweh, the Elohim, the Deuteronomical, and the Priestly, and they kind of chopped it all up, and I was pretty surprised to learn, I think it was Pope John Paul II who believed in this, and the amazing thing is they've actually had some literary studies that prove there's absolutely no way this could have been written by four people. They found an amazing chiastic structure in the entire flood account. Um, besides the fact Jesus says that the Torah was written by Moses, Moses. and so does the Bible. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the otherwise good people signed off on this because they thought, well, we need a little bit of advance in the modern world so they don't all think we're kooky, superstitious people. So let's show that we can compromise on evolution. Let's show we can compromise on this. Then maybe more people will come. Well, nobody came. <laughs> right. If Christ didn't rise again in his body and walk around and eat fish and wasn't touched by Thomas in his wounds on Sunday, why should I wake up early and go to Mass on Sunday? Why not exactly. play golf? Why not? Yeah. If it's all about nature, why not just enjoy nature and skip out on mass, especially if all that lame music and, you know, Paul said people, the same thing. Yeah, we're the greatest of fools if Christ did not rise from the dead. Precisely. And he wasn't referring that we believe in the, and, and, and revere Jesus in our hearts. He was referring to an empty tomb. And it's amazing how many of the apostles, when they went out to all these lands, Matthew to Ethiopia, Thomas to India, James to Spain, how much of the resurrection was confirmed with actual miracles, like everywhere they went. This is how yes. God convinced pagan peoples of the truth. St. Francis Xavier in India, raising the dead. They, an entire town immediately converts because they see it. So if we try to extricate miracles from a religion founded on miracles, we're going to be nothing, left with nothing but secular humanism, and we might as well be Unitarian Universalists. Or, like you said, just better to go to a, a Dallas Cowboys game on Sunday. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, as long as we're on this topic, I think another one of those big questions people ask on Mary's life, I saved the tweet that you had. Um, I normally don't learn theology from tweets, even yours, but this was on 12 18 and you said, um, Aquinas was Mary and Joseph's marriage, or sorry, Aquinas says Mary and Joseph's marriage was quote-unquote consummated because of the incarnation. The intention to bear and raise offspring was realized in a miraculous and virginal way. The end of their marriage, sorry, the end of marriage was fulfilled in their marriage. They were truly married. Someone put that on Facebook, um, the question about how is it that 
that Mary and Joseph remained virgins their whole life, um, but they were still considered uh, married. And I love this tweet, but maybe you could expand up, upon it a little bit. Sure, sure. And we're moving through these things, Father, really quick. If people want to get more, like, for example, on the painless birth, I, if you go to my site, taylormarshall.com or YouTube, I have a podcast and an essay with tons of citations from the Church Fathers, or you can listen to the whole version. Version. It's uh, episode 17, and almost all these topics, if you, if you Google them um, or Google my name with them, you can find all the footnotes and citations. So I, I just feel like we're going so fast, I want people to be able to, you know, they're going to want to tell their friends about this. They need the citations. So I just no, want to let Marshall, know about we're that. We're only going to promote my blog today, okay? Okay, or yours. <laughs> Anyone, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Hey, go look at his stuff. No, he's got awesome yeah. stuff on that blog. Um, so would they just Google your name in that, or do you, do you actually have a search function on taylormarshall.com? You can do either one, but if you just do, uh, you know, if you go to YouTube or you go to iTunes, uh, mm-hmm. you go Taylor Marshall, Painless Birth of Mary, you can get a whole podcast, and it's just literally the whole thing's on that. Or you can go to my website, taylormarshall.com, and I have several articles. I get asked, This comes up every, every few years, and I just have to keep rewriting it. And that's awesome you quote church fathers and popes because a lot of the lay people listening out there, they'll go talk to a priest like this, and the priest will say, that's a sweet devotion for you to have, but it's not what the church teaches. And then mm-hmm. if they can have in their pocket a few of these quotes from like right. infallible councils, scripture, church fathers, yeah. popes, that's really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, sorry, the, the next question was the... Yeah, um, just um, the, the marriage of... Mary and Joseph, how is it actually in there so since it wasn't consummated physically? There's a great sacrilege that happens every Advent. It always happens, almost, well, no, it almost always happens in Protestant churches. It's happening more and more in Catholic churches, sadly, and it's this. Mary was a unwedded mother. Mm. It's blasphemy. It's sacrilegious. Mary was not an unwed mother. Mary, I read to my kids last night in preparation for the Feast of St. Joseph. We read the gospel story. She was espoused to a man named Joseph. Now, in in Judaism, there's a two-stage wedding formality. There's first the espousal. And and I have a book called The Crucified Rabbi. I explain all this and how it relates to Catholic understanding of marriage. But there's the espousal, and you are married at that moment. Really? You are married, yes. Is that right? It has to be a divorce to break it. Because I'm embarrassed yeah. to admit this, but when you said Mary is an unwed mother, I thought, I didn't hear the heresy in this. So I'm certainly learning something here. What's part two after the espousal? And then part two is, is the actual um, the meal. This is what we see at the wedding at Cana, where there's a big party and a meal. And this is the, the consummation of the couple the sexual consummation. So you have the espousal, and then you have the, con- the consummation. Obviously, following the party. Yes. Uh, I've, I've heard, I've never verified it, that sometimes it actually happened during the party in a different location. Like in a tent or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is the espousal uh, I, the same as our modern engagement? I had understood in the old Code of Canelon, possibly the new, there was like a pre-engagement people could go through that was espousal. But would you say this was equal to modern espousal or equal to modern engagement? It's akin to modern engagement, but it's more. It, it, it mm-hmm. renders a, a contract. It renders a matrimony. Yeah. Okay. And so, so, so they, were, they were a spouse. Mary and Joseph were espoused. Um, they were truly married. It would have to yeah. have been a divorce to separate. And we know as Catholics that the two ends of holy matrimony are firstly the procreation and education of children, and secondly, the unity and the good of the spouses. This is just classic Catholic teaching, Mm -hmm. affirmed in all ages. And so people have said, well, you know, the tradition is Our Lady had a vow of virginity going back to her childhood. Maybe Joseph was a virgin or not. We could maybe talk about that if you want. Um, so if I Mary certainly hold he was. Yes, I do too. Um, if these are two virgin people who have no intention of having kids, how can they have a sacramental marriage? Right? Because there's no intention right. Right. to consummate, and there's no intention to procreate a child through a sexual encounter. And Thomas Aquinas is genius on this because he says that both of them, 
made a fiat of their will, a let it be done unto me, to welcome into their marital union a child. Now, it happened to be a way that no other human being, human couple has ever experienced, nor will ever experience again. It was a hypostatic union of the God-man, second person of Trinity, um, united, you know, it, fully to God, and also having a full human nature, the divine person, in the womb of Our Lady. And both of them, as spouses, consented to that. And so they did will the procreation and education of children. It was Jesus Christ. And so Thomas Aquinas says, because of that fiat of both Joseph and Mary, their marriage is a valid matrimony. Beautiful. It is a valid marriage. Yeah, wow. it's really wonderful. And also think about it like this. God, from Adam and Eve to this very day, has sanctioned that children have a divine right to be raised by their mother and their father. Mm. This is why adultery is really... A, it's it's impure, but it's a crime against the child because the child has a right. A right, to, gotcha. A, a, based in nature, based in creation, yes. to be raised by his mother and father. Now, because of sin, there's adultery, um, there's rape. Um, sometimes the, mo- the mother or father die. There's divorce and remarriage. So all of these things are aberrations. But God, in, when he made Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply, he desired positively for every child to be raised in an intact home. This is why Joseph was brought into the story. God didn't need mm-hmm. Joseph to work the incarnation, but Joseph was brought in to mm-hmm. show that his will and creation extends even into the divine economy with the incarnation. You know, we see a little seminal version of that theology, even in the fourth century St. Joseph, you know, I, um, today's 1960 Divine Office, so the ancient Divine Office, we actually have, uh, just for Matins alone, um, 10 Psalms and 9 readings. And one of the readings wow. of St. Joseph says, Why was the Lord conceived of an espoused virgin rather than of a free? First for, the sake of the gene- first, for the sake of the genealogy of Mary, which we have obtained by that of Joseph. Secondly, because she was thus saved from being stoned by the Jews. As in a- Thirdly, that himself and his mother might have a guardian on their way into Egypt. Now, obviously, that's St. Jerome. It's obviously developed um, through the ages to be even more than that. But that third one kind of um, shows a little bit of what you're saying, this uh, guardian on their way into Egypt. Correct, yeah. I mean, our, our Lord, as, as uh, you know, he had a human nature, and he was a child, and it is not required, but as I say in scholastic theology, it is fitting that the the incarnate Son of God would have a guardian father. Beautiful. Yeah. Next question, beatific vision. Did Christ have it, and did Mary have it on earth? Yes, yeah, so with Christ, it is, it is undisputed up until really the 19... Uh, probably 1910s, 1920s mm. is when you start having, um, as you mentioned, some of those early proto... Well, they were modernists. Pius X called a modernist. Oh, well, actually, Dr. Marshall, let me give, just for listeners who don't know what it is, so Beatific Vision is the full vision of the Blessed Trinity, which, of course, Christ is the second person of the Trinity had. The question is, in his sacred humanity, did he also have the Beatific Vision while he walked through the fields and plucked grains, while he slept, while he was on a boat? Um, the normal things that he went through in his sacred humanity, did he also see the fullness of the Blessed Trinity? And, um, and, and you and I and St. Thomas Aquinas would say not only as the second person of the Trinity walking the earth, but even in his sacred humanity. Am I correct about that, that even in his sacred yeah. humanity had that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely correct. The only thing I would change there, just to be super specific, is fullness. Mm-hmm. Um, fullness of the divine essence. Um, we, we might, okay, so just to back up, the yeah. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are fully God, right? They are the triune right. God. And each of them um, obviously see the divine essence, they fu- but they fully comprehend it. So in, in Catholic theology, there's comprehension of the divine essence, and then there's vision of the divine essence. And only the three persons of the Trinity have comprehension. That means they have perfect knowledge and vision of everything that God is. Mm. Humans will have the beatific vision. We will see the divine essence. Think of it as a giant movie screen that you're looking into, and it has no edges. It just goes off, right, mm. in every direction. 
And this is how St. Anthony of Padua can find your car keys. He looks into the divine essence. Right, right. And he can see, oh, the car keys are under the couch. Right? He's not omniscient like God is. Mm-hmm. So he's participating in the beatific vision as a saint in heaven. Every saint in heaven has the beatific vision. Our, our lady has it the greatest, right? That's right. That's right. But, they're, but they, don't have, they don't have beatific comprehension. They don't, gotcha. see the, they don't see it to the max limit that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit see it. So right. just to clarify, the three, awesome. persons, yeah. the three persons have comprehension of the divine essence. All human, saint, human persons have the beatific vision, which is not comprehensive. Okay, so that being said, you, you said it perfectly, Father, you know, regarding everything on there. And so the question is, does Christ, and maybe by extension does Mary, because she had no sin, do they have the beatific vision in their humanity? So Christ, the Son of God and his divine person, obviously has the comprehensive vision of the divine essence. But in his soul, Mm -hmm. did he have it, for example, when he was a four-celled embryo Mm -hmm. right after the Annunciation, when he didn't even have a brain? And Thomas Aquinas and the tradition would say, yes, Mm. the human Christ has the beatific vision in his soul. Remember, it's not in your brain, it's in your soul. Mm -hmm. In his soul, right. Yeah, and and Christ has a rational soul, body, blood, soul, divinity. Is that the vision of the essence in his sacred humanity he has there? So in his, in his divine nature, he has the comprehensive vision of the divine. But in his soul, yes. he has the beatific vision, which I'm assuming because the soul is finite, mm-hmm. even though it is Christ's soul, it is not comprehensive. Okay. And this is how we can understand, for example, you know, him, you know, in his suffering on the cross and things like that, that it's not comprehensive, but it is the vision of God. It's the beatific vision. And do you think someone like Von Balthazar denied that he even had the beatific vision in his soul yes. so as to make it more applicable on the cross that when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that at the affective level, he could be more um, relatable to us human beings? Once again, this, this naturalism of wanting to make him relatable. Why do you think Von Balthazar, who, you know, more or less listened to the St. Thomas Aquinas on most things, why would he deny that? Well, I, Balthazar, I don't think Balthazar followed Thomas on most things. Um, <laughs> right. I'm, very, I'm very anti-Balthazar, <laughs> people know. But, no, it's, 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 again, it goes back to Our Lady. Well, how could Our Lady, how could women relate to Our Lady if she didn't have pain in birth? So you it's know. bringing everybody down, right? We have to bring instead of all the doctrines. Yep. Yeah, we get, instead of us being elevated to divine things, which is what all, you know, the Carmelites teach, we have to dumb everything down. So it's like, well, if Christ had... If Christ was basically his, in his soul was was beatified, well, I can't relate to that. I can't mm-hmm. relate to a Jesus mm-hmm. like that. I want to be his disciple. And so he needs to be like me where I'm not sure what my vocation is in life when I'm 20 years old. And that's how Jesus was too. He wasn't sure what his vocation was either. So you're like Jesus. And this is just dumb. Mm-hmm. You know? It is. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. And it's not going to win anybody because the goal is divinization, not sitting around saying how great is it that we're all fallen human beings, you know? Or, so or even if you say Jesus, even if you say Jesus is, is sinless, just say, well, e- you know, even Jesus, when he was 12 or 13, you know, at the temple, even he was sort of amazed or astonished, like, wow, what, what is God's plan for my life? This is really cool. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, maybe use that as a launching point. Did, did he know in the temple his mission that he was God? Absolutely. He knew yeah. when he was an embryo. When he, remember, exactly. Yeah, exactly. When he was an embryo, he knew yes. that it was his task, that he came as from the bosom of the Father as divine love. Yes. You know, he did not abhor the womb of the virgin, as we say in the Te Deum. He came into the womb and waited patiently, knowing that the cross was set before him. And he, he rejoiced to be a servant of God and to, and to redeem us men, sinful men. And even the mystics are very clear that Mary knew Seconds before the Incarnation, uh, this is getting aired on the Annunciation, so, you know, Gabriel appears to Mary, and the mystic is very clear. Mary was given this vision of the life of Christ, including all the horrors of the crucifixion, before she said yes. Maybe some of the mystics would have said even before that she knew, but my understanding is she was given this entire download before she said yes of the entire passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. So, of course, Mary always knew 
um, of the resurrection, um, but she also knew of the crucifixion from the time she was 14 years old. Right. I, I would I would be a little cautious. I would say we're now in private revelation, and I would yeah, right. I would be okay with that. I'm I'm not at all opposed to it. But I think we can go from just what we know from the liturgical calendar, yeah, and the feast of Our Lady, and you know her presentation at temple. I often say, people say, who is the greatest theologian, Taylor? Greatest philosopher, Thomas Aquinas. You know, and I say, no, Our Lady. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's the one that pondered these things in her heart. She had the incarnate Christ in her womb. She had a connection with Christ that no priest, no pope will ever experience. And she was without sin and concupiscence. That's right. Which means her, her mind was fully illuminated to the mysteries of, of salvation. And so she understood, go ahead, yeah. Sorry. yeah, she understood all of these, you, the Summa Theologiae to her is straw. She's like, been there, done mm. that, know all of that. That's right. Thomas. Wow. Right? Thomas Aquinas is her acolyte. So she knows all this. <laughs> and, she, and we know from the liturgical calendar that when she was three years old, she was presented at the temple. And she lived there as a consecrated virgin. Yes. And Jimmy Aiken kind of came after me a while back on this. And I, I've shown, again, TaylorMarshall.com, mm-hmm. that Our Lady, from the fathers, from tradition, she was, there were consecrated virgins at the temple. Absolutely. And she was one of them. And so she is there at the temple. She is daily hearing the Psalms and the scriptures chanted and taught in the temple. Would Jimmy Aiken have denied that there were Essenes making private vows? Don't they have proof of this even in the Dead Sea Scrolls that there were Essene communities yes, making consecration? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But we keep getting exonerated even by modern archaeological finds. To I know it. I know it. And so... She would have, just by sitting under the teaching, without concupiscence, with a pure intellect that's not distracted like ours is, when we're like, oh, I need to go get a candy bar, or oh, I'm thirsty, I'll put my Bible down or my breviary down and get mm-hmm. distracted. She wasn't like that. So just by hearing all of the Old Testament prophecies, of which there are over 300, in, in the back of my book, Crucified Rabbi, I give over 300 prophecies of Christ and the sacraments in the Catholic Church, she would have already fully put, put the picture together and understood it. So, when the, so whether it's 20 seconds before Angel Gabriel gets there or 20 seconds after, when she hears, you are the mother of the Most High, you're the mother of the Messiah, she already knows. Thanks, and mean? thanks for that real mild correction. We don't even need to go to private revelation to understand through divine revelation, public revelation, that this is the only way it could be. Yes. So I, so Mary, did Mary know that, you know, Jesus was going to have his hands pierced? Yes. She knew that from the Psalms. Yes. Did she know that, yes, that his, that his side would be broken exactly. open? She knew that, right? Exactly. From the prophets. Yeah. Um, did she know that a virgin would, you know, give birth to the son, the son of David? Yeah. She knew that from Isaiah 7. So all of these, and even I would say extended this, not as much as Mary, but Joseph also as a devout Israelite man, would have also appreciated all these prophecies. So, you know, there's a tradition that right. Joseph was present with Our Lady at the visitation. Hmm. It's, not like, it's not like the 14-year-old Virgin Mary is like, hey, Joseph, I'm going to go into the hill country of Judea to visit Elizabeth. I'll see you in a week. Joseph, the guardian of the Virgin, went back, okay, great. I'll see you when you get back. Now, you don't let a 14-year-old girl walk through the hill country of Judea by herself. Oh, uh, right. Right. So a lot of the mystics, too, see Joseph at the visitation. So when Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord comes unto me? He knows what that means when she says, Theotokos, mother, mother of my Lord, mother of God. He knows what that means. You know, and it jumps to private revelation again. I don't know if you've read this, but, you know, Joseph really, really wanted to be at the crucifixion. And it was this great pain of his heart that he died before the crucifixion. And I've wondered for a while, this is just a personal theory. I don't have any uh, backup except just kind of my own prayer on this. What's a father's number one job to do for his son? It's to protect him. So I think there's no way Joseph could have been there because he would have defended him. He would have pulled, <laughs> he pulled out, out his, his car- he would have pulled out his carpenter pliers and started pulling the nails out. Probably. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There's no way <laughs> in divine point. providence and sovereignty that a father made to protect could allow his son to let that happen. So he, he couldn't have been there, you know? Um, last topic, and this is uh, at the end of Mary's life, do you believe at her assumption she went into cardiac arrest before that, or was she assumed alive at that moment? What do you think of the dormition? So I wouldn't say cardiac. I, I know you're a, you're a uh, uh, what were you again? 
Uh, yeah, paramedic uh, and EMT. Paramedic, yeah, paramedic. So cardiac arrest means the heart dies, right? Um, uh, yeah, it stops, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it stops. Um, so it is the teaching of Thomas Aquinas, the church fathers, particularly the Eastern church fathers, and, um, and even Pius XII, who was the one who defined the Assumption of Mary in 1950. In, in that document, he refers to her death. He refers yeah. to her tomb. Mm-hmm. Only dead people go into tombs. And so even though when he mm-hmm. declared that um, her body was assumed into heaven, he uses the term having completed the course of her earthly life. So he doesn't say dead, right? No, the word, uh, you're so, right. The word dead is there. I did a Latin search once. And here's why I did it. I had a, he's a pretty good priest. And he said, well, the church never really defined at the end of her life what that meant because there was a debate. But I looked in it, and you're absolutely right. It actually uses the word death in Pius XII's 1950 document right there. Yeah, Munificentissimus Deus, which is by Pius XII, 1950. Uh, here's a quote from it. Uh, Venerable to us, O Lord, is the festivity of this day on which the Holy Mother of God suffered temporal death. We cannot be kept down by the bonds of death who has begotten your son, our Lord incarnate from herself, end quote. Pius XII actually quoting a previous pope, Pope Adrian I, in that section. So it's a pope quoting a pope, talking about how, in an infallible document, about how the mother of God, quote, suffered temporal death. Now, the mm-hmm. distinction here is that mm-hmm. Mary, of course, did not die because of sin. The wages of sin are right. death. That's right. So this is what people want to protect from, and we fully support it. Um, That's right. But it is the teaching that her body and her soul separated. That's the definition philosophically mm-hmm. of a death. So her soul separated from her body. And the tradition is three days later, her body was brought to heaven and rejoined with her soul and mm-hmm. then crowned queen of heaven. Did the Greek Orthodox disagree with us on any of this, with the, what they call the Dormition? Are we kind of on the same page with them as long as we believe she died? Yeah, well, they, they refer to it as the dormition, which is the falling asleep, which is a euphemism for death. Yeah. And if you look at a dormition icon, I did a video um, with uh, Deacon uh, Dozier, who's a, a Eastern Catholic uh, deacon, and we looked at the icon. This is on YouTube. You can search mm-hmm. for it. Mm-hmm. And in the icon, Jesus is holding a little baby doll, a little baby girl. That's the soul of Mary. And then in front of him, mm-hmm. surrounded by the apostles, is the body of Mary dead. Wow. So you can see the soul of any Dormition icon. Look at it. You see that Jesus is holding the soul of Mary, which has already left her body. And then the tradition is, Thomas was late, just like he was late at the uh, mm-hmm. Easter. And so Our Lady, he says, I want to see Our Lady one last time. So they open the tomb, and she's mm-hmm. not there. It's just full of roses. Wow. This you is know, how, you by the way, know. roses get attached to Our Lady. It's from this story. Oh, from that all the way back. Yeah, yeah. And then Thomas sees that it's empty. They all see that it's empty, and they know that she, her body's been taken by Christ. Wow. All the way from there to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yep. You know, and it's a good point you make that the wages of sin is death. Mary had no sin. Why should she die? You and I talked a little bit about Mary of Agreda uh, right mm-hmm. before we started. And I don't know if you know this, but in number 739, God actually gives her the choice. He says, I have caused thee to enter the world free and exempt from sin. Therefore, also death shall have no tight or permission to touch thee at thy exit from this world. If thou wishest, it's very interesting terminology. Mm-hmm. God's actually giving her a choice. If thou wishest not to pass through it, come with me now to partake of my glory, which thou hast merited. And this is what Mary answers. My son and my Lord, I beseech thee, let thy mother and thy servant enter into eternal life by the common portal of natural death, like the other children of Adam. Thou who art my true God has suffered death without being obliged to do so. It is proper that as I have followed thee in life, so I follow thee also in death. Close quote. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Stuff. Beautiful. That's the Franciscan tradition. Uh, the full, uh, a fuller version of that is that um, Our Lady, because she consents to death, that Christ um, gives her the plenipotentiary power over the realm of death for those who are mm. saved, which we call purgatory. Oh, right. That's why we understand she frees and em- empties purgatory on certain days, right? On Saturday, yeah. Saturday. And in fact, uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but there's a, uh, I think it might be Francis de Sales or someone from that period. Uh, it's given to him to see what day of the year the most souls 
in purgatory are released from purgatory. Mm-hmm. I would have thought it'd be Easter or maybe All Saints mm-hmm. Day mm-hmm. or All Souls Day. It's actually August 15th is the day that the most souls are released. And that's Beautiful. because Our Lady, because remember, if she, if she didn't choose it willfully, this is why Jesus gave her the choice, it wouldn't have been meritorious. But mm-hmm. she did will it. Yeah. He gave her the choice. So when she willed it, she merited the power over death. Now, you can't take yeah. anyone from hell out of hell. That's right. Purgatory, see, she merited. And so that gives her this super abundance of influence and power over the realm of the dead, which we call purgatory, for those mm-hmm. who die in a state of grace. And this is why you have the Sabbatine privilege, which we get from mm-hmm. the Carmelites, where she mm-hmm. goes down every Saturday and brings the, her Carmelite devotees, those that wore the, the brown scapular, from purgatory. So her, she has a very unique relationship to purgatory and to death. This is why the Hail Mary says, pray for us sinners now and when, at the hour yeah. of our death. Boom. Because that's where she has great power. I think if there's any listeners, probably most of my listeners out there wear the um, scapula. But if you're looking for something practical to do, if you don't have it, please, please, please go get the scapula this Lent. One last thought for you, Dr. Marshall. You know, we sometimes think of Franciscanism as sort of this hippie version of Catholicism. But when you were talking earlier about how Mary was the greatest theologian, I was thinking back how interesting it is that so many of these Franciscan saints like St. Maximilian Kolbe call Mary the destroyer of all heresies. Um, I think mm. Anthony of Padua calls it. Why do all the Franciscans call her the distor- destroyer of all heresies? And it's precisely that, because she is the greatest theologian. And we need her more now than ever. I keep going back to the, um, the Thunder Clouds of Mary by St. Louis de Montfort and how he says at the end of time, there will be these people who just crush heresy and worry about nothing and just leave the gold of love everywhere they go. And I really believe um, that the, the mark in what I think is the greatest church crisis in history, I mean, I don't think Arianism holds a candle to what modernism has, has ravaged upon the church. And I want to close with a quote from St. Maximilian Kolbe. He said, quote, Modern times are dominated by Satan and will be more so in the future. The conflict with hell cannot be engaged by men, even the most clever. The Immaculata, the Immaculata alone has from God the promise of victory over Satan. However, soon in the heaven, the mother of God now requires our cooperation. She seeks souls who will consecrate themselves entirely to her, who will become in her hands effective instruments for the defeat of Satan and the spreading of God's kingdom upon earth, close quote. So, Dr. Marshall, thank you for uh, being with us today. And I think everyone out there would agree that you are uh, one of those instruments in Our Lady's hands that is uh, crushing heresy. And we know that that triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart is coming despite our enemy mocking us left and right. We know that triumph is coming. Amen. And I would just say, everybody, wear that scapular and pray that rosary. That rosary is the weapon. She gave it to St. Dominic. That's our, our most powerful, of course, the sacrifice of the Mass. But for we lay people, uh, that rosary is so powerful. So every day, Our Lady of Fatima said, pray that rosary every single day. Get those five decades in every day. Amen. Thank you so much. Say I can't tolerate you Cause your feet's too big